All right. Well, <clears throat> do you have a harmonica? Can I, I? I like to be in key for my intro. A harmonica. Yeah. Do you... <laughs> no. Uh, it's okay. I'll. I'll uh... Hello, everybody, and welcome to a comedy advice podcast with me, Steph, and your host. Joining me today, very special guest. He's a comic and comedian club owner. Wow. Jim Perry, everybody. That sounds weird. I, it sounds great. And you've got a perfect name, too, like Jim Perry. Yeah, it sounds fancy. Yeah. Mine, Stefan Satani, I sound like I might be a model for like Dior or something, but you sound Jim Perry. It's like the everyday nice. friend and pal and dad. <laughs> yeah. Jim Perry. It's wonderful. Look at you, though, man. You're killing it. You're like interviewing all kinds of people. Your podcast is blowing up. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think... I've become your dad. <laughs> Oh, thank you. You realize so- if our dads hugged us, none of this would exist. You know oh, that, I right? totally agree. <laughs> so- Dad, I, you're still out there. So please, one hug, just one. Just one. One, I love you, and <laughs> it would have, none of this would exist. You can even text, even you can do yeah. a Snapchat. It's deleted forever. So no one will know it's <laughs> there. But it's so good to be here at JP's Comedy Club. Yeah. Last time I saw you was what, a year ago? If yeah. Not if longer. And I, I never told you this. I got in a fight with my wife after your podcast. No way. About what? your wife. No. What yes. happened? So your wife, by the way, is beautiful. Thank you. Thank and you. Um, I didn't tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, if you started there, that's going to be the problem. But where I did start was I was like, oh, his wife was so sweet. She brought out cheese, crackers, drinks. Yeah. I said, that'd be, you know, something nice when people come over, if you brought out like food and stuff. <laughs> um, did not go well. No. <laughs> I slept on the couch that night. Oh, and no. uh, it wasn't even the couch in the house. It was the couch in the courtyard. <laughs> so... <laughs> but, oh, um, no. Did yeah. you wake up to a plate of cheese and crackers? No, I, I woke up to something else, and oh. it was not a plate of cheese and crackers. <laughs> there was a multi-type substance. No, that's gross. Yeah. Oh, God. That's a shitty joke. I apologize. <laughs> All right. No, that's beautiful. And, yes. I'm red, and I'm so sorry that I caught my wife and I caused you some uh, It's all your fault, of course. Time. Not my common sense of not saying such things. So It's okay. I get You know, I get that all the time whenever we're watching movies. And she'll she'll see I don't know because we also get to watch what she wants to watch. So then mm. we'll see a Channing Tatum film, and she'll be like, "Do you see what he did for her?" Yeah. And I'm like, "Yes, that's fair." But then I can't go to a porn and be like, "Do you see what she did for him?" Yes, don't do that. And that, Chatham Tatum, his film, I got tricked into watching. You know that movie Magic Mike? I know one and two. Yeah, yes. not about a magician, just so you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she tricked me into watching that. But how long have you been married? I've been married since 2000. 13. So you should yeah. still be happy. That's not that long. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'm happy as a clam. Just... I've been married 25, 26 years. It's, it's, oh it's God. like a hostage negotiation at this point. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> pray for me. <laughs> so, you know, I was yeah. going to say, I think I just had my first reconciliation when you got married. So, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's good. Uh, that's maybe. good. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy though 22 years and you guys are still going strong i see her supporting yeah, I, you i tease she's a very very good woman and yeah. uh great mother good friend and uh i tease and she allows me to tease she allows me to exaggerate things on stage that are not always to the positive for her or me <laughs> and she gets it to joke and that is important so i feel i actually do feel like that's very important and i feel a lot of successful comedians you included you talk about your life because you make it yeah. personable and you make it about a unique story essentially right and so a lot of comedians they talk about what's going on in the people that are in their lives which sometimes is at their expense i feel like there's a balance of self-deprecation plus making fun of the others right. which i think you do and i think it's it's also important to those people that their family members or the people that they poke fun at are supportive of that. It helps us not get canceled too. So yeah. I, if I talk about myself, my kids, my wife, <laughs> that's my only people I have to answer to. <laughs> so it's a lot easier. Yeah. And with the club, like my wife works yeah. here, my kids work here. Um, I mean, it's, it's really becoming like the little family owned business. And I think people like that. It's kind of cool. That so, is um, adorable. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, I saw your son in the bathroom as I was, uh, he gave, <laughs> no, <laughs> give you a, what? <laughs> I should finish that sentence. Yeah, you really should. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a tip or I gave him a tip. Okay. This oh, you is gave not sounding better. This wow. is not sounding yeah, better. Yeah. Oh, there was the colognes and We're stuff. We're Irish. It couldn't have been much of a tip. So <laughs> no, my son runs the sound and helps me, um, at the counter. 
counter and then the wife sits everybody and it's just, it's cool. It's, it's been, it's been really neat. Um, I mean, we're happy we did it at first, you know, it's a little bit of a midlife crisis that's gone a little bit exaggerated, but that's okay. That's okay. So it's been fun. That's fair. And you know what? I think that's absolutely adorable that the whole family helps out. And I want to talk about the club and why you decided to get a club in just a second. Yeah. But, uh, get a club. It's almost like get a car. But, um, I, I was curious, does your, your kids, are they interested in comedy and working in a comedy club now? They're more exposed than ever. Do they feel? Well, what's funny is I think they had interest in comedy and now they've attended every open mic that we've had. And after hearing, um, God only knows how many dick jokes. Um, they're not in the comedy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. They have they have gotten better into roasting dad. I think the best roast uh. is my my youngest the other day tells me I look like Nicolas Cage if he had type two diabetes. Oh no. So and these are the jokes that they consistently like listen to and then t- say to their mother and me. So oh. no, but they <laughs> they they do have an interest, I think, in the business side of it and have okay. learned learned like how the structure of business works what happens behind the curtain but i i can't foresee any of them coming on stage and telling jokes that's just not who they are i see um, i see and a lot of times when they're here and we're all doing our thing and my son he plays the one song before comedian and then the one song after nice and i peek in there and he's on his phone so he <laughs> he, he does not care what we're saying about anything so oh man god i can't imagine just being uh, how old is he my youngest is 16 and then my oldest is 18 and okay. then my youngest will be 17 in a couple of weeks oh so, wow yeah wow awesome so they're uh, 17 almost getting ready for college yeah my one is uh graduating this year and then my other one you know thinking about it, he's be a senior in high school they're only 15 months apart almost wow. irish quinn twins so. oh man yeah <laughs> so. that's crazy and and i also wanted to talk about opening the club too because last time we had talked on the podcast we talked about you getting into comedy and you hadn't gotten jp's <laughs> comedy club yet no then as time transpires, there's a pandemic, and then in the midst of the pandemic, you opened a comedy club. Yeah. What were your thoughts around it? Did you see it was an opportunity? Yeah, I totally looked at it as an opportunity. I'm surprised at how many people thought it was crazy. Mm-hmm. So um, my wife and I were involved in investing in real estate. And when 2008 happened, as everyone knows, it was a terrible time for real estate. People were losing their houses and right. all that stuff. I looked at that as an opportunity to invest in homes. So yeah. we bought a ton of houses I think we bought five, six houses, rented wow. them out, and then flipped them, you know, five or so years later oh, and did really man. well. Nice. But my point was, is that was an opportunity when I've always believed that if everyone's running from something, you run towards it. Yeah. And that's how I felt about the pandemic and like rental rates and mm-hmm. agreements within a lease and, and stuff like that. And um, I was like, you know what, if we're going to do this, this is the time to do it. And there was a couple clubs that closed and I'm like, well, mm-hmm. there's an opportunity to, to get people that are looking for work to come to us and perform with us and looking for an outlet of some kind. Cause they don't have a connection yet. Right. And then ironically we had, it took a while to get a liquor license mm-hmm. because of that. We, for a little bit, when we opened, we're the only club open because, because I didn't have a liquor license. I was, I was not considered a bar yet. So because of that, we were allowed to be open. Because of the way oh. they did the laws here in Arizona. Okay. They closed okay. all the bars. And I'm like, well, I'm not a bar yet. Huh. And they're like, well, yeah, technically you can be open. I'm like, okay, we're open. <gasps> and we were limited capacity. Right. But for a short period, we were the only one. So that's it was wow. a good way to get eyes on the club early on. Wow. So I didn't look at it as a terrible thing. I mean, it was maybe more difficult to make a profit quicker. Right. But I actually think it happened for a reason for us and i think it was worth it at the end so, yeah and, and we're doing good now we have our liquor license and it's making more sense that's that's fantastic and i think that there's a huge impact on what you said i hope for the listeners and the watchers the watchers that sounds creepy the <laughs> viewers i think that's a better term but to what you said of of you run towards things when people run away from it and i think that is so true and pointing back to the real estate investments back in 20, 2008 well, when everything all, was crashing yeah we've all heard what is it uh, buy low sell high right but most people don't do that right if you Emotion, actually do it yeah. then it, a lot of times it'll work out for you it, it you know it could have went bad but it didn't so yeah, yeah. um yeah, sometimes the most simple advice is the hardest to take. Exactly. Yeah. So it worked out for us. And I think 
I think there's a little luck in that too. So yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And I think it's something so important where I if the panic sets in. If we're listening to, I don't know what tangent I'm going off on here, but if you listen to just the media and you become afraid of what's happening around right. you and you don't start to dig and see what's actually happening. And sometimes maybe it is what the media is portraying. Sometimes it may not be, it might be deeper. And so understanding what's going on with a level head and then just being able to make decisions and actions that can be good in the long term are really important. Yeah. And I, I really wanted to open a, up a comedy club. I really had yeah. a lot of reasons to want to do that. So that's amazing. And how has it been going now? I know you've been a co uh, a comedian for what three years at least. Yeah, uh, just just about that. Yeah. And now you're a comedy club owner. What yeah. has it been like being on the other side, <laughs> dealing with comedians? Dealing might be a harsh word, but working yeah, with comedians. Where most comedians is who listen to your podcast. So <laughs> I'm trying to be as politically correct with his answer. No, I think, you know, there, being a comedian and yeah. being a business owner is two very different things. And I think the comedians that understand a little bit of where the business owner is coming from mm -hmm. are more successful. Because they understand that I have financial burdens to make sure things will work instead of just always giving stage time. Right. And the comics that realize that get it. But I mean, there's so many things that I see now behind the curtain that I never understood as a comedian. Mm. Like even, so we get, and I am not exaggerating, I get 20 to 50 messages a week on guys wanting to get on stage sending videos and messages and just I think it's important for comics to understand that bookers and I would be considered a booker right now because yeah. I haven't delegated that yeah um to understand that there has to be some patience involved because I book guys maybe one or two days a week and then I'm worried about other stuff um like when I'm doing shows on the weekend, that's not a great time to be asking me a ton of stuff and not have patience because I'm in the middle of trying to get through shows. Right. So right. when all the shows are over and you know the club may be closed, that's probably when that booker or whoever is doing their administrative duties. And that would be a good time to reach out. And I never really thought of that as a comic, but mm. it's little. And then, and then looking at that now, it's like common sense. Yeah, this is not when you want to bug them. And then right. videos, when you send a video to a place, Make sure it has sound, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you'd be, you'd be really surprised. Um, oh my god! Or not to be one where you know you are horribly heckled or <laughs> you are cut off because you are bombing. Like I am amazed at the videos that I get, and then I get guys that are very professional in the way they interact and stuff. Right. Um, other things for comics to consider is like, I get a lot of comics that'll say, Hey, Lana, I'm going to bring 20 people to your club and I'm going to, I'm going to get you on the map and, and I'm a new business owner. So someone's saying they're going to bring 20 people in there and they're somewhat funny. I'm like, I'm encouraged by that because yeah. I'm trying to pay the bills here. Right, right. And then they come and nobody shows up. I've hired extra staff and they're like, Oh yeah, something came up, uh, you know? So being truthful, having yeah. integrity and understanding both sides of that coin yeah. is going to be like, I rather, and I think a lot of bookers and owners would say this. I would rather deal with a guy that is somewhat funny mm -hmm. and professional than a guy that's super funny and has no professionalism in him at all. Yeah. I rather deal with that person all the time. And the reason that I also um, opened the place was because when I was a comic and I still feel I'm a comic, right. I felt like my experience as a comedian is the scene was only catering to. 5% of the comedians that were out there and 95% of them didn't have a port of entry mm -hmm. into the scene or at a club on a weekend show. They could do a bar show. Or they could be at a bigger club on a, an off night. Right. And I wanted to be the club that, that helped guys get on a weekend show. The port of entry was not difficult. And we, we are being very good about booking guys from our open mics or we take our classes. We have classes here and getting them on a stage and becoming like the gym of comedy to get them ready for the bigger venues. So nice. I, I, my intentions here are good. And I, I think the comics and most comics love it here, but I mean, um, it, it's definitely been a journey and I'm not going to talk like I'm an expert. I've been doing this right. eight months, but 
I've learned a lot in eight months. Yeah. I know a lot. And then we also have Tony Visick that's attached to the club who's been doing comedy over 40 years. So he's a great Is that mentor. why he's hugging the wall outside? Yes, <laughs> that's why. Yeah, he's trying to make sure I don't say anything bad. Um, but that's where I met you, right? It's Tony yeah. Visick's class. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we were doing a comedy class. Yeah. But uh, I think that was a very long-winded answer to your question. But No, that was a beautiful. Yeah. I, I love the gust of wind, too, because it's <laughs> a little hot in here. No, it's perfect. Yes. But, uh, yeah, the great answer. And then also, I mean, it seems like, like you said, comics are loving it. And we were just talking before the show, the mm -hmm. open mics on, like, Thursday. Yeah, we have open mics every Thursday. Um, the list goes on at 9, and then um, the show starts about 9.30-ish. And we've been going to one, two o'clock in the morning. And ah, wow. uh, we allow uh, spots to be available for the comics that are 10 minutes and say your typical three to five. Mm -hmm. So again, a and you know, there's not a lot of money being made in an open mic when you're, you know, we right. just comics aren't notorious for buying things. But at the end of the day, <laughs> I want this to be a place where guys can get better. And yeah. I think that's why the open mic has been so popular. And wow. we book people from that mic on weekend shows. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. What? Who do you guys have coming up on the this weekend? I I know last weekend or the weekend before there was Eric Bernal, and then um, yeah, and Eric Bernal I believe is a newer comic. Yeah. Um, but he's killing it. He's gonna be uh, he's doing a show at Wild Wild Horse Pass or something soon. And yeah. Um, you know what? I I feel terrible. I can't. I think we have Jay Penn coming up this week. Oh, okay. And nice. uh, he's been doing comedy for a while. And then uh, the week after we have Mary Upchurch. Oh yes, and then Alex Elkin, I believe. But yeah, um, nice. a couple I met of, Mary through Tony's class. We too. have a Chicago guy coming in, an LA guy. Yeah, Mary's great. I met her in class too. Yeah, and then we really try to cater to um, a lot of the Phoenix guys too. They've been doing comedy for a while, so I want it to be the local, intimate, boutique type club. And we sit a hundred people, but I think a lot of comics will tell you you can have 15, 20 people in here, and it's fun because it's a small room and the sound stays in, and it's a oh. good time. It, it, I was amazed when I first came in here. We might do like an MTV Cribs style <laughs> video afterwards where we could show it, but it really is beautifully set up. The chairs look comfy. I'm sitting in one right now, actually. They're church chairs. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, and what's funny is this club, before it, we made it a comedy club, was a church, which was great because you have to have all these ADA requirements when you open these type of places, uh -huh. and all of them were done. So the stage Whoa. was here. A lot of the chairs were here. So it made the transition easy. So, oh. um, but yeah, half of our chairs are the church chairs is what they call them. And then the other half are tables and chairs, your typical comedy club type tables and chairs. That's amazing. And then you guys most recently, I can't remember if you mentioned this already or off the pod, but just got the liquor license or beer and wine. Yeah. So we, there's different types of liquor licenses and we have the beer and wine license. So we have a variety of beer wine champagne and then uh, a bunch of non-alcoholic beverages then we do snacks and stuff but you know it's an hour and a half show we, we give right. you enough alcohol to get you ready for your next event <laughs> so we we pre-game you pretty well <laughs> so uh, that's wonderful yeah. i remember when i lived on the east coast uh, when i lived on the east coast i started to go back up there but um there were a lot of places that didn't have any liquor licenses yeah they're, they're expensive like, they yeah yeah so it was what they would end up doing with these are restaurants that i'm speaking Speaking of, but I remember when I lived in Jersey in some places in New York, there were no liquor licenses. BYOB. So then they'd BYOB, yeah. which was kind of cool. And then they also they'd put like a, a bottle opening or cork opening. Cork fee. fee. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, those laws get real tricky in Arizona. And then it depends on the town that you're in. And it depends on the, the strip mall that you're in. It depends on where you're located. So mm. unfortunately, we weren't allowed to do any of that here. Um, but I, I and I don't know exactly because I don't really remember anymore, but um, you have to be very careful where you're at doing that kind of stuff. So I see. Yeah, I see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I winked for the video viewers, but um, no, I was just going to say too. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. This is also not even the thing that you're doing to feed your family. This is no. a passion project. Yeah, this isn't going to feed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, along with with the comedy too, it seems like, and I think we had talked about this on the last episode that you were on, but yeah. it was a, a second or third midlife crisis that got you into comedy. You've already got a I job. Quite a few. <laughs> running, <laughs> running smoothly and everything. And so I was yeah. going to ask, Coming into it from that approach, where usually, from what I've seen at least, is somebody they might not have a, a proper nine to five or something that's really sustaining yeah. them, and they just dive into comedy and hope it works. Oof, yeah, you've kind of made it's kind of the reverse. Yeah, yeah, and and I was going to ask if 
would you have tried to do it the other way? No. Fair enough. Not like, not even like an explanation either. Like, <laughs> no way, no way. You know, and keep in mind, my, my story is so different. Um, right. You know, I, I got married when I was 19 years old. Mm. Um, so I felt as a guy, like I have to provide for my family right away. I've had those stresses. Yeah. And then my work history, you know, after high school, if you will, cause I was engaged in high school. Um, I was in the military and then I was, may I ask, yes. How did you propose to your wife? Um, we are from Chicago and I proposed on Lake Michigan on in a deep dish pizza. Yes. That would have been, <laughs> that would have been much better for me. A little more cheesy. But I'd but... probably be back on that couch if I did that. A <laughs> um, little more cheesy. I just caught I'm that. I'm sorry. Nice. I'm sorry. Wow. If these, if those jokes land here, I got a lot of stuff to say. Um, <laughs> yes. This is on brand. No, we, uh, we went on some like uh, boat that you, you know, you go on there and they act like it's the new year and they do a countdown and we had dinner Aww. and then I proposed outside. Yeah. Oh, and the skylines in the background. And, that's very yeah. sweet. Very and, sweet. And uh, yeah. So she, she, she got mad it was gold plated, but you know, I had to do what I had to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Especially I dude, thinking about when I was in high school, if I was to propose to a girl, I don't know what I'd do. Probably just shove it in her locker and then shove it in her locker. Sho- yeah, that, that sounds like a bad euphemism that, yeah. for something else. <laughs> what you do at prom. Is that foreplay talk in your house? I don't know. Oh man, I never could get the combination right. So I, I yeah. was never in the locker. Yeah. But anyway. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Back to you. So you. This you is were... how pent up married people talk. Just so you know. <laughs> Sexually frustrated married men are talking right now. Which is the name <laughs> of our next podcast that Jim and I are doing. <laughs> it's a channel on Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, but you had gotten started, uh, or you had gotten married at nineteen. So that urge to be able to provide for your wife and yeah. And everything so I mean, we there. were high. We're a typical like high school sweetheart right. story. And then I went into right. the military. I was in the Navy for two years active, six year reserve. After the military, I became a police officer. I did nice. that for about ten years. I got hurt, and then um, we moved here to Arizona from Chicago. And then uh, I why, why did up, you guys end up making the move to Arizona? weather, weather, and weather? I have oh. two cousins that nice. live here. And every time I visited them, I'm like, why the hell do I live in Chicago? Um, and Chicago is a great city, but right. it's the cold that hurts. And, oh and even God. the summers with the humidity, no regrets. I mean, you know, raising our, our kids here and stuff, it's been great. For how horrible the weather is in Chicago, I would expect a less pleasant accent. Because the way that you talk just makes me... It tickles me inside. Do you, do so, I, you feel I have an accent? Still? A little bit. A really? little bit. Maybe it's not the accent, but it's yeah. like the intonation on the words. Yeah. But I'm it's drinking wonderful. a pop and I just talked to my ma. <laughs> yeah. The ma and pop. Yeah. That's how I, what's well, funny is when I public speak, I think it comes out more. Than uh, in, and my wife's is really strong. Oh, okay. but the story of actually okay. moving here the day that it happened is, is a bit funny to me is yeah. I was literally shaving ice like in oh. chicago in the winter you start your car and you wait a half hour i remember know? that in jersey yeah it was, it, it, it was horrible and i was stationed in jersey in the service that's a Ooh. whole nother place but i'm scraping the yeah it's funny you join the navy they tell you join the navy see the world i joined the navy to see the world they sent me to fucking new jersey that was and and it deserves that fuck <laughs> oh fucking God. new jersey um but anyway i'm scraping ice off my car and my hand slips <gasps> and I cut my knuckles open. Oh. And my wife is outside the car about to get in. And yeah. I said, that's it. We're moving up Arizona. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> she it was a one, one time only that my wife like was not going to argue back. She saw me. I'm bleeding. She's like, okay. <laughs> and we did. And we did. And then once we got here, I had gotten hurt on the police department. So we moved here. Right. And then I, uh, I opened up a home security company. And that really has been doing great. I've been doing that now for 10 years wow. and that pays the bills. Um, Amazing. That's and, really cool. and then I got into co- a comedy as, as like a hobby and it got out of control. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's really cool. And then yeah. co- did you always have the taste for comedy or did it, did it just, you so, got. So I think you saw all the records in the green room. Like I have like over 500 comedy records. I always yeah. loved comedy yeah. and I always listened to it and enjoyed it. I never thought I'd be the one to go on stage, uh-huh. but I had jobs, even though I was in a cop, I, I did dare half my career. 
And we all know how effective that program was. <laughs> um, but my point was I was very used to talking in public. Right. And, and so I think when I started comedy, it was an easy transition because I, I, all my jobs, I've always been a public speaker in those. I was real involved in our church. I did like I youth see. pastoring and stuff for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, do you still do that? or? Uh, I just stopped doing that. I okay. My kids are older now, but I was doing it when they were younger. Oh, okay. Okay. And then what was the business, the home security company was doing real well. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a enjoyment, enjoying comedy, but it's the business started running itself. I, I, I was honestly managing it from my phone. That's and amazing. what happened was I got lazy and I let the, the business do its thing. Yeah. And I, this is not an exaggeration. I was watching Netflix 12 hours a day. And the wife's like, no. <laughs> so I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I don't want to work. I, I have no reason to force myself to work. So I signed up for a, a comedy class. Oh, and okay. the first, okay. I took comedy classes everywhere. I took comedy class at Comedy Spot with Sean Dillingham. Oh, yeah. I took comedy classes. Yeah. The comedy spot, not Sean. I don't know where he yeah, is. Yeah. So, no, I think Sean's alive and well. Okay. Um, and then I took uh, <laughs> the pause and the grin. Um, and then I, I took uh, comedy classes at Stir Crazy with Deanne Kincaid. Okay. And I, I wrote a screenplay with Deanne. She's a great, great person. I and don't know I, her. She's great. She's a teacher and, and does. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't Rona. get scared. Okay. Yeah, I know. No, I already got it. It's okay. I already had it. Got the shot. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Still got herpes, not Corona. All right. Um, but yeah, I took, uh, I took classes with Deanne and then I took uh, classes with Tony Visick and that's nice. where we met. Yes. And then yes. after taking all those classes, I started doing open mics and I just got really into it. Nice. And then I started producing shows at the American legions and raising money for charity. And I was like really liking that. And, and I, I like business. So I mean, yeah. that's, I've always liked business mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know, how can I turn this into something without chasing stage time everywhere and just work on my craft, give back and have it pay for itself. So it, you know, as long as this pays for itself mm -hmm. and I don't need it, I have something else to rely on. Right. So that was what got me into comedy. And then it's just been a transition from there. And I was, I went, I got crazy. I was, I was, I was driving to LA or, or Burbank at flappers. I was driving six hours to do five minute spots. Oh, God, I mean, that's, dude. and now I was like, yeah, my wife's much happier that I'm 20 minutes from the house <laughs> to do my five, 10 minute spots. So, but yeah, it's, it's been cool. And I, we were talking off air. Yeah. You know, I've, I really worked hard. I, I mean, I've been working for 20 some odd yeah. years and, and owning a business, you know, when I started the business that's now doing well, I was working 14 hour days, six days a week. And, <sighs> and now I'm to that point where my kids are grown and I want to do something a little bit more selfish and more fun for me. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm approaching this in, in what some would say a backwards way. But for me, it's, I like not that mindset of I this has to work out like I if this is the peak of my comedy career I'm happy with that yeah I really I'm I'm okay with that and I like what I'm doing right now yeah and I think that if that makes sense I don't know that makes a lot of sense <clears throat> and I feel I don't think I've been and put myself in a position where it's like this has to work out yeah. or else I'm going to be homeless or whatever yeah, I yeah. also have my nine to five this is my passion project but it hopefully it can continue to grow What's and your nine to five giving tips in the bathroom? Is that, that, is that what you, that's right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's, that's a well-paying job. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Uh, but no, it, it, uh, this is my passion project and I love doing it. But I think that some people have said that being their only option forces them to thrive. But I also, for me, yeah. sometimes when I have multiple things in the air and I'm juggling multiple things, yeah. I feel less pressure and to that like i have to do well or else bad things are going to happen and it helps me be more comfortable and grow in those yeah. those areas and i so. think everyone has their own thing that works for them you know yeah. i yeah. uh i i like how it's going and then yeah. um and as long as we're all doing comedy and it works who cares yeah you know yeah we all got dick jokes to say <laughs> The, a, a, a fountain of dick yeah. jokes yeah Just, i've heard uh, i've heard quite a few of them here on. in phoenix yeah <laughs> It's really cool. To, I, I was going to ask because your father, a husband, business owner of multiple businesses and comic. How uh, it is sounds your... like I'm much cooler than I really am. Just so you know, <laughs> yeah. You need a so you need a plaque or something. I, I mean, just your wanted... tombstone is going to be occupied yeah. with a lot of. I just wanted to be the guy that could say, "Yeah, where are you going? I'm going to the club." 
It just sounds so cool. Oh, it sounds yeah, really bad. Because I was never allowed in the clubs. So, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I basically, for the podcast, I'm like, babe, I'm going to the office, but just in the house. Yeah, so right. it kind of, it's depressing. That's right. Maybe one day. But anyway, I was going to ask, what is your day to day like where, are you trying to focus on comedy and is this taking a little bit of time out of it or um, where have you had to make sacrifices, if any? I am so structured with my week that it's going to sound like I should be on medication. I mean, and without that structure, it wouldn't work. Mm. So literally Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, I focus on my other job, my yeah. security job. Mondays I do, this is going to sound corny, but I, I do a boy date day. So I take one of my Cute. kids out every Monday at night. Oh, that's and nice. And then Tuesdays is our date night as a couple. Okay. And then um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday I'm here and I'm doing shows and I focus on that. Yeah. And Sunday we're involved in our church and we do mm-hmm. our church stuff. So I, I really try to stick to that schedule. And then we also as a couple go on a vacation like every other month, even if it's just a one or two day thing as a family, we'll go on like a two week vacation once or twice a year. But I, I'm always been one that I have to be very structured to a point where I don't, I don't, I, I, it's almost like crazy. Yeah. And, and even my days, like, you know, this is when I'm going to write jokes and this is when I'm going to work out and the workout thing's not going well. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, so I don't know if that answered, but I, it, I'm very, very structured in the way I approach life. It did. And it makes a lot of I sense. I think the military did that to me. I really do. I, the, they just beat that into you. Yeah. And I don't think it's all bad. I really don't. I don't think it is either. Yeah. And I think I remember there was a book by a I don't know if, what branch of military he was in, but he was talking about the first thing he does in structure. He makes his bed in the morning. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah. talks about the importance of that. It is important. And I, I totally agree. At first, I was like, that's mm. one of the tenants in recovery. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. That's and, one of the first things they tell you to do in recovery. I'm real involved in recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm involved in a program uh, called Celebrate Recovery within our church. Uh-huh. And I truly believe, and I know people have different opinions, but I right. I believe everyone suffers from some type of brokenness in their life. It, it's some type of hurt, habit, or hang up. Yeah. When you tell someone you're in recovery, they a lot of people assume, oh, it was a drug or alcohol problem. But there's a lot of different issues we deal with. Yeah. Um, but my point is one, it's a 12 step program of whatever issue you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I teach it now, but I used to be very involved in it with my own stuff. And, uh, one of the very first things they tell you is make your bed. Huh? Yeah. That's one of the very first things. That is, it makes so much sense and, uh, not enough sense for me to actually make my bed, but (laughs) it, it, so I hired someone to do that for me. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so my wife makes the bed. Yeah. No, but I I have, and it's interesting to hear about your structure where it's this day is dedicated to this, this day is dedicated to this. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that I can learn from that because the structure is very important to me. The way that I approach it is I usually have certain times where my wife, she has to wake up at 5.30 to go to work. Mm-hmm. So I'll wake up at 5.30 with her. Yeah, but have instead, coffee with her and yes, get her off, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, some of those things. Yeah, and um, or she gets you off. I, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> and so we end up. I I do. I'll make breakfast and then I'll do. Um, I'll work out and then mm-hmm. I will write and then I will do some podcast editing, some outreach, and I have this structure set up, and yeah. it gives me so much you have security, especially now with the pandemic, which it hopefully is starting to to free up. But especially then, it was like, this is one thing that I have some sort of control over. Yeah. And if you approach it, in my opinion, yeah. if you approach a day without any structure, then things are just going to go to the wayside. I wouldn't have that date with my wife every week. I wouldn't have that one-on-one time with my kid. Um, I would, I wouldn't be able to manage the, the club or my business. And, and I, I have to have that. Yeah. And there's times, I mean, I'm, there's times that days go right. awry, life right. happens, right. but I think if you generally have that structure, it makes life more approachable. I, I don't like surprises. I never have been that guy. Um, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I, I want to know what's happening. You yeah, know, and that's probably just some kind of control problem that I haven't uh, <laughs> looked into enough. But, um, yeah, I think that's real important for people that are just getting married to kind of understand that. Or even let's let's it's a comedy advice 
right. podcast. You know, people that'll structure the day and, you know, this is the time that I'm going to write 10 jokes or whatever that looks like. This is the time I'm going to practice those jokes. And those comedians, that do, or this is when I'm going to choose to take a class or listen mm-hmm. to a podcast or, mm-hmm. or study my craft. Yeah. People that approach that in a structured way, I notice as a club owner who those people are. You can tell. And they're better comics. They just are. So I don't shoot the messenger, but I, I really believe it's true. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree with that. And yeah. that is really cool to learn. And I'm going to try to do the day by day approach too, because sometimes uh, if I try and squeeze, I'm like, okay, podcast stuff, workout and, and whatever else I'm doing, that's it. That's really sad. But sometimes I'll focus on one more than the other. Maybe I'll do four episodes of the podcast. So I got to really edit, but then yeah. I don't have any time for writing where if I dedicated a day to writing, I might be able to get more done. So I'll experiment yeah. it and report back to you on the next episode. Yeah, it's really important what you eat and drink. Like, you know, like soda is really bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast brought to you by Is Pepsi Okay? <laughs> but Jim, this was an absolute blast so far. We're not ending yet. I know right. I made it seem like that, but we're going to get into the comedy advice portion where we're going to answer some questions oh this is when i crash and burn okay. <laughs> no, no you, you did great last time and uh you know what i still get emails from google my business from the grand canyon about new reviews about um people losing their pants do you remember that oh at the grand canyon yeah that's yeah. funny yeah. yeah yeah anyway so before we get into the questions we're going to get into an inspirational quote to jazz us up to be able to answer these questions but before i get into mine do you have any inspirational quotes that help get you through those days when you're not feeling motivated you know uh we talked about recovery and there's a yeah. there's a very common quote in the recovery program one day at a time and i live my life that way um, when I was younger person, I, I suffered from like a lot of depression and stuff mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, bad thoughts and not to get too heavy. But my no. point is, is one day at a time, one moment at a time, one second at a time, if people are having a bad experience or suffering from again, a hurt habit or hang up and just look forward to that next moment, mm-hmm. I can promise you things will get better. But if you, if you focus too much on that one moment and make a bad decision. That's not what we want. So for me, a quote that's really meant a lot is one day at a time, one moment at a time. And that's a recovery, um, type quote. That's pretty strong. That's really nice. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. The, it's really strange to me too, because I, I was reading a book about recovery by Russell Brand, which was very interesting. Oh, I could see him in it a couple times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. a funny guy, man. Yeah. Yeah. And and he was talking about and I, I He's real into like uh meditation and all that yes. stuff right now. Yes. And that that and and at least the way he talks now is I think it changed his life. Um yes. recovery was one of the best things I ever did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm interested in doing it now, too, because... And again, it doesn't mean it has to be an alcohol or drug thing. It could be whatever your brokenness that you define that is. Right. You know, did you have a mommy-daddy issue? Did you have whatever that is? Right. A codependent issue? Yeah. Um, A lot of us have stuff that we don't like to talk about, especially men. Yes. You know, coming from the military and a police background, like... Mm -hmm. It was sad to me on how many men don't choose to, to talk about their issues yeah. and try to deal with them in an inward way. And comics, sometimes they'll a lot will say, well, I, I talk on stage, but it's important that if you need professional help or to talk to somebody that's, that's qualified that you do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, recovery is something that means quite a bit to me. So that's, oh, yeah. that's really great. That's really yeah. cool to hear. And I actually, it, for me, what it is, I, I need to talk more about and recognize things because right now I tried to get into cognitive behavioral therapy where it's starting to try and recognize those feelings instead of push them away mm-hmm. and then try and trace those back to the thoughts that cause those feelings mm-hmm. and understand and, and, and then analyze those and be like, are these thoughts realistic? Is this actually what would happen? And then hopefully trying to change those thoughts and trying to change those patterns that are getting you to those negative thoughts. Yes. Yeah. I haven't gotten to that part yet, but yes, I think that's the next chapter, but it's beautiful to see. And, and I think that I think I'm doing great, but I think I could be doing better in terms of being more productive, being a better person, being a better husband, et cetera. And I want to be able to find out if there's the science out there and if there are recovery programs and things like that, like, why not try and do that? Why not try and invest in yourself? Yeah. And There's make yourself a recovery the best? program that changed my life is celebraterecovery.com. 
Nice. And, uh, I'll put it in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, it too. is a Christian organization, but it worked sure. for me. But there's, you know, whatever. All to me, a lot of the recovery programs are good. Nice. And then, nice. Uh, really, what helped me the most is just writing five dick jokes a day, <laughs> and that was the best recovery I had. <laughs> yeah, that, my quote is one dick at a time. It was that's... getting way too serious. I had a, <laughs> yeah, one tip at a time. Oh, right. that's beautiful. Well. That's a beautiful quote. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> we we have, or I have a quote that's actually by a robot. It's not by oh, any this person robot whatsoever. Guy, yeah. Yes, it's by a robot, and it uses AI to take some of the deepest and best words known to man or woman and just mash them together for a beautiful quote. Okay. So this week, let me know what this means to you. This week, Inspirebot says, please don't eat mice. 90% of all health authorities think that it's uncool. To eat mice? To eat mice. Oh. It's uncool to eat mice. I've, I don't... Dealt, I've dealt with a lot of rats in my life, but not <laughs> mice. Um, eat mice. Have you have you ate my wife's cooking? Or <laughs> eating mice would be an upgrade. Now, now, this is why I end up on the couch. <laughs> you know what? Because I'm trying these. to be funny, and this is not going to work for me. This will be the one part she brings up in this conversation. That, what, what did you say about my cooking? <laughs> um. Yeah, I I mean I've been to some sketchy Mexican restaurants. I've probably ate mice and not known it, but that's okay. That's okay. You I, know, if you put enough salsa on something, it tastes okay. Mm, delicious. <laughs> yes, a micerito. Delicious. Yes. All right. Well, I feel like I'm now, hung. I'm hung like a like a, a mouse, like a, <laughs> a field mouse in a blizzard. But yeah, other than that, that's okay. <laughs> well, I feel inspired from that. Thank you, Jim. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you. We're ready to get into the questions. This first one is from the Reddit advice column. Dustin found it. He says, how can I become better at socializing and networking at parties? I, 20-year-old male, have basically zero friends. I have some guys that I go to party with sometimes, but I don't consider them good friends. Every party I'm at, though, I get drunk, and when I try to talk to someone, they just ignore me. I usually end up sitting on a chair or in the corner not saying anything and just watching. It's probably best that he's doing that if he's drunk, is my <laughs> advice. Um, my my advice to him would be maybe not get drunk. Maybe have – he's 20. 20. So we're already committing a crime. Yes. Um, <laughs> Where's the Pepsi? Yes. Pepsi is okay in this So, scenario. yeah, I would I would suggest uh, being himself and uh, not feeling that he has to mask who he is um, by drinking and just right. having the courage of starting the conversation. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Maybe. And he'll be in recovery by the time he turns 21. Oh, <laughs> so... beautiful. Beautiful. I love this. And yeah, um... you know what's funny is like I, this is going to sound obnoxious, but it's true. I never had trouble dating girls when I was younger. And I thought, it, I think it was a lot because I just had the guts to go up to them. Mm. And my wife, um, I, I'm biased. She's very attractive. She's a nice girl. She's yes. a good girl. And she'll tell you to this day. Um, I got her because I was the only guy willing to say hello to her. <laughs> so it's like, you got to have the courage to talk to them. You know, you really do. I tell my boys that all the time and they're scared of their own shadow at times. So. <laughs> oh, but man. yeah, he's, uh, don't mask it with the alcohol and just buck up and, and, and say hello. And I and, like that. Yeah. Simple. Stay away from the sauce. And you know what? Maybe, sauce, yeah. maybe, maybe give your friends or give them the sauce, make them yeah. a little drunk. So then you'll appeal. Yeah, do cocaine instead. Do it. <laughs> It makes you a lot easier of a conversationalist. <laughs> <laughs> Icebreakers just done immediately. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh man. Don't drink. Try meth. <laughs> Try Yeah. I, That's the Apache Junction party. So oh, we had it. <laughs> Cottonwood too. That's where I grew up. And I was uh, just in Cottonwood. Were you? I loved Cottonwood. Cottonwood's amazing. It really well, I Well, at feel least like... the one strip I saw was a lot of fun. We did the train ride out there and we had a blast. Oh no in Clarkdale? Was it? Uh I don't know. It, we were in Cottonwood. We yeah, cl that's and then you uh, like pass through Old Town to do and... the train ride, and yes. uh, this has now become a tourist uh, talk. <laughs> and then we did the one strip where everything's at. Yeah, and my wife and I, we have this thing. This is a good date idea. All right, I've never been told this is a bad idea. So we nice. on dates again. I sound so cheesy. Um, <laughs> it sounds like you know the white picket fence around the house stories. Uh, but we uh, we have an uh, a drink. Okay. At one restaurant, an appetizer at another restaurant, dinner at another restaurant, another uh, a dessert, and then another drink. And we end up going to like five, six places on one date. 
Oh. And we have a blast when we do that. My point of the story being we did that in Cottonwood yeah. for two days and, of course, saw everything Cottonwood had to offer. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I thought you doubled back yeah, to the other one yeah, for the last Yeah, I think you drink. had to visit a couple of <laughs> twice. But my point was that's a fun way to, to date the wife. So just think about that. That is a really good yeah. tip. And it's also if you have ADHD – it works. So, yeah. Yeah. You could say whatever you want to the waiter and then you just move on yeah, after that. Yeah, you just move on. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Uh, oh, that's really cool. I was going to say, what was I going to say about Codman? Oh, meth. Yes. Plenty of meth. That's yeah, did not know say. that. So I'll yeah. have to go outside of the main strip next time. Yeah, I'll let you know the name of the guy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. All right. Moving on to the next segment. This one is a new one, Jim. It's called Positive Spin. And so what happens, we were talking a little bit about this, but something bad happens and you immediately start to think of the negative. And so what I've done is I've prepared a scenario where it's going to be something bad, but we're going to have to try and think of the positive so we can help train our minds to think of how so to So the resolve. glass is half full. Exactly. Okay. Maybe I All should right. just call it that so I don't have to explain it <laughs> so much. Wow. wow. Jaw is tired from all yeah. that talking. So, Jim, in this scenario, your wife, your, your, your sweet wife, she gets bit by a radioactive porcupine, and then she gets superpowers. Amazing. <laughs> However, <laughs> the superpowers are she can read your mind, so she can read your thoughts. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> Are there are there any positives that you can think of that she has scenario? now superpowers and can read my mind? Well, my wife is a porcupine because when <laughs> I hug her, I sometimes get stuck, <laughs> and uh, she's called me a prick quite a few times. <laughs> um, what is the positives of her reading my mind? Um, I think that she'll notice that there's not a lot on my mind, um, <laughs> and all the things that she thinks I'm thinking. I'm actually thinking of nothing. <laughs> There's nothing going on up there. Just a blank canvas. I think she would be pleasantly surprised that I am more simple than uh, than she might sometimes think I am. You know, I think yeah. my wife would think the same exact thing. Yeah, we do that in the car all the time. We're on a road trip, and she, and I guess I have an expression, yeah. and she'll say, "What are you thinking?" And it's very serious in her questioning, and I'm like, "Nothing." And she's like, "You're thinking of something." I'm like, "No, nothing." I th you know what? I think I have the same face. And she has like spaghetti brain. Like she thinks of everything all the time, every time. So it's uh, weird. Yes. Yeah. My wife is very similar in that regard. She's yeah. always, oh, do you know this, this, this? We have to do this today. What are you thinking about? And, and I'll just be staring there and I'm like, oh, I wonder if uh, Donkey Kong was the first choice. In the game. <laughs> it's very blue and pink thinking. It's very different. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, I haven't. What are they? I, we went to some seminar, marriage seminar. We've been, you know, seasons of marriage, and you go through these self help yeah. things. And yeah. It was like uh, men have an empty drawer, so we're in the empty drawer, and then the women are in the junk drawer. And uh, I don't know. I, I know they said it a lot more poetically than I'm trying to explain it. But I love um, how yeah. every <laughs> all these seminars, because we've been to those, too. And yeah. it's like the, you guys just have to realize the guy is just so dumb. Yeah, He's we're just, we're so just dumb. stupid. <laughs> like, after a while, you're just like, OK. <laughs> all right. So I think you nailed it, though. Some good oh, okay. positives on that one. So we'll move on to the last question. This one is from Ted it says, what are your tried and true methods to get rid of bad dreams? That's it. So I guess let's start off. Have you had any bad dreams? I, I do. Dreamer? I, I dream a lot. They're okay. not necessarily all bad, but I've had bad dreams. I, if that, are we answering this real or are we, we being can do funny? <laughs> we, can, we, we can start off with real and then we'll go funny. I think, uh, I'll let you do the funny part. Okay. I'll, I think the rea oh, I think the reality is, um, what I've heard is, you know, you don't want to eat late. Yes. And, uh, I, that's all I got. Yeah. You're not supposed to have like sugar past six o'clock. For and, me, it's and ice cream. Anything. Ice cream. Are you real into this like fasting craze that's going on? I haven't done fasting. I think but... there's a lot of truth to it. Like you're supposed to uh -huh. eat in like, there's all these theories now that you're supposed to eat in like a, an eight hour window. And if you can, a four hour window and some people once hmm. a day and supposedly people that are doing that type of fasting are not having bad dreams or having better sleep, wow. more REM sleep. So my advice to him would be look into intermittent fasting. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. That was a fast answer, That's too. That's the best I got. <laughs> oh, so, that was great. It's it's interesting, too, because I'm thinking, I guess, the way that we or take, evolve. Or take shrooms, and if they're going to be bad, make them fucking really bad. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like just, just go, ho- go yeah. hard or go home. Go like way that. over two grams of shrooms and just <laughs> fucking jump in. <laughs> Pick some meth. You know, yeah. if you do meth, you'll never go to sleep. Yeah, so take you a trip to, to Cottonwood dream. and and go to go have meth. Talk to Phil. Yeah, and, uh, he's off the eighty nine A. Oh, uh, Phil. Yeah, I, I may have met Phil. He's also a waiter at the at Nick's. Yeah. So. Oh, and now we went to Nick's. <laughs> we absolutely went to Nick's. I paid way too much for a four ounce fillet. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, it was, that's Nick's. I, I saw the price. I get the steak. I did not look at the ounce ratio and i was like no this can't be fifty dollars this is four ounces of of meat oh yeah which is two ounces more than i give my wife every night but that's a different (laughs) that's a different story (laughs) it's a lowercase t-bone in the wife but uh, you know if you actually flip over your plate there's some meth taped on the back so that's where the extra price came in i see i see but anyway, by the way, the owner of Nick's, I think he owns several different restaurants. He does. He's The hotel we were in, I think it was called The Tavern. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yep. they're connected to all those restaurants in some way. Yes. Did you go to Jerome? Uh, we did go to Jerome. Okay. Uh, we did Cottonwood for two days and we went to Jerome one half a day. Okay. And walked around and we watched. Jerome is an interesting town. I never had been there. Yeah. And we, they, we went in this one place, I can't remember what it was, and we watched a 25-minute video about the history of Jerome. Yes. It was five bucks. You pay the five bucks before you know where they're going to even take you, by the way. <laughs> and then we watched this video, and this video, we're doing this podcast in 2021. This video was cut and edited in 1982. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like... Really, in in that much time, you couldn't like edit this like once or <laughs> update it in any way. And that town was like a mining town. Yes. And then it's haunted. And then they had yeah. a bunch of uh, uh, prostitute houses out there supposedly. And yes. There's uh, it was very interesting. Very interesting. I used to work at the Grand Hotel in the restaurant called oh. the Asylum. So in it, high which school, is supposedly haunted and all that. Yes, everybody I worked with had a ghost story, and they would tell me about how sometimes the silverware would float or something. I, they were also incredibly high. Yeah. So I, I think that may have had something a lot to do of drugs. with it. Yeah, maybe. So I I we never went, saw anything. I also wasn't on drugs or high. So I. <laughs> we maybe, went to the haunted hamburger. Or yes, something like yes, that. yes, yeah, yeah. yes. That's and, right. And uh, we went to some candy store. I don't know. We had fun. A very hilly town. Very much. I so. thought I was. We, we. I had a couple drinks, and I thought I was gonna hurt myself, but it worked <laughs> out. So, <laughs> but we had. We had a good time. Amazing. Yeah. And so, but I think going back to your point, though, eating, not eating before going to bed. Oh, totally great lost the question. We're <laughs> yeah. talking about totally. The question's yeah, a ghost yeah, yeah. now, but we're gonna try and yes. bring it back. I, I think. Don't eat after six. That would be my official answer. And I was gonna say, don't eat. On social media, don't be on your phone until a certain time. What I usually do oh. is when I go to bed, I will leave my phone outside of the room. It does not get to go. It goes on the couch. That's actually. a good habit. And yeah. that is a habit that I need to practice because um, it's tough. when I wake up in the morning, one of the first things I do is look at my phone. And I read somewhere, I don't don't quote me, but it was it's really bad for your brain. It's really bad for your eyes. Yeah. Like you're supposed to wake up and like go outside, you know. Yeah. I think I'm gonna sound like a dad. I, I think that we're supposed to be more connected to nature than we are to what we're really connected to now with social media, being indoors all the time, electronics. I really think that it's important to go on that hike and be connected right. to nature right. instead of to our phone. Yeah. Well, I on my phone, I don't know if this is a regular thing or if it's a setting I didn't I messed up on my phone, but it tells me every week how long i was on my phone for the week and it's disheartening it's the worst do you have thing that too in the world. is it a real yeah. thing okay and then I, the notification is like ha ha because it's yeah. like get off of me but also look how long you've been on yeah, me it's, and and it's depressing and yeah. i'm like i this is disgusting so yeah so don't look at your phone it's horrible before or after 
Exactly. Yes. I what I like to do. I think you're right about the stay nature. off social media as we do a podcast. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Follow us on Instagram. <laughs> but uh, and yeah, you can follow I, me at the Cop Comic and CopComic.com. Okay. Links in the show notes. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I usually like to wake up and then I go and then I go outside and then they say be barefoot so that you're touching yes, the, earth. the electric. Uh, there's electricity in the earth and all this. We've yeah. yeah. I think my wife and I. I don't know what happens when you get in your 40s. I'm 40 years old, so I don't. <laughs> I'll know, leave that out. That's yeah, okay. I don't know what what happens, but we're getting more like hippie-ish and spiritual. And, yeah, and yeah. and you know you you get you feel mortality. You know things are things are hurting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to uh, live better, sleep uh, better. So uh, that's great. That's so great. fasting. Don't look at your phone. And uh, don't watch scary movies. Watch comedy. Watch comedy. There you go. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So then you'll have funny dreams. Different pathways. Perfect. Yeah. I have I have this constant dream. This is not a joke. <laughs> I've had this dream all my life, and it's so stupid. My wife has caught me doing it. And I know it sounds weird. Oh, okay. Let me finish. I, like, <laughs> <laughs> I have this dream that I'm flying, uh-huh. and I literally kick my legs when I fly, and in my dream, and I and sometimes it's a bad dream. If I kick my legs slower, I start to plummet towards the <laughs> earth, and she'll catch me in bed kicking her. <laughs> and I've been doing that for years, years. Oh my god! What and, uh, a beautiful griff. But That's... I haven't, uh, I haven't crashed just yet. So. Oh my god. Yeah. H- have you broken any of your wife's bones from? The... I've kicked her before, and I remember one time I was. <laughs> Uh, I was having a massage and okay. uh, a legal massage <laughs> and, uh, I had a massage and I fell asleep and I was having that dream and I kicked the masseuse in the face and I felt, I need to write a joke about it. I felt awful. And, uh, Oh man. She never came back after that, so. <laughs> but I totally fell asleep. And she at first took it as a compliment that I was so relaxed I fell asleep. And then I remember I was starting to have that same dream that I've always been having, and I kicked the poor girl, and I felt terrible. Oh, but, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So, well, all right, that's great. <laughs> I was gonna say I, um, because uh, I was thinking about I don't know if you have a certain chemical deficiency, where or or the chemical is produced to paralyze you when you dream. So sleepwalkers, they have a deficiency in that. And I remember my brother, he would sleepwalk all the time. Yeah. And he would end up, he would just walk to the trash can and piss in it and then yeah, yeah, go yeah. back to his room. My son sleepwalks, my, my youngest huh. one. And I thought he was joking at first. And he's asleep. And he does. He'll walk in. He'll look at you like a zombie. Oh, no. And 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 then you're like, well, do I say anything? Because I don't want to freak him out. Right. And he looks fucking possessed, man. It's scary. And he's like, and then he'll just turn around and go back to bed. It's so weird. <laughs> he's the creepiest yeah. thing in the world. And the worst thing I've seen him do is he'll find the dog. And we have a little six-pound shih tzu. Yeah. He just picks her up and he brings her to bed. And I'm like, Nathan, you awake? And he's not awake. He's asleep. And then he'll go in the fridge sometimes and eat, or he's got me. Conv- he's got me tricked because he looks asleep to me. So, oh my but my God. one son sleepwalks all the time. We have to put special locks on the doors and all that stuff because we're afraid to, you know, go outside. Wow, so that's yeah. crazy. You, but the the kicking your legs to fly in your yeah. dream. I also I would always get in these fights when I was sleeping, but then oh. that chemical was there. So yeah. whenever I tried to punch. It was just oh, like, yeah, yeah. Eh. and so I punched you know the little what? bitch. I, yes, you can't punch correctly. Yeah. I used to, when I was a cop and I'm sure that there's some connection. Yeah. I had this dream that I had a guy assaulting me with a knife Oh. and I would pull my gun Yeah. and I, the trigger pull was like a thousand pounds. Like I couldn't pull the trigger. Oh yes. And then yeah. right before he stabs me. I'd wake up and I oh. had that dream for a long time. And I, th- I, I heard from somebody, it's a pretty common dream. Yeah. You know, it's something you're nervous about or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I had a dream. I was on a podcast once and <laughs> they just started talking about nothing for yeah. minutes <laughs> and then talked about cottonwood and math. It got weird. Yeah. It got weird. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know what? I feel like it was a good dream. And we're about to wake up. Listeners, if you guys are in this dream with us, thank you so much for listening. We've reached the end of it. That was Jim, great. It was an awesome pod. Thank you where, for having me. Oh, thank you for joining. Yeah. Where, where, and thank you for welcoming me into your castle. Yeah, my like castle. This yes. is... It's a very dark castle. <laughs> Can't wait to see the dungeon. But yeah. uh, I wanted to ask, where can people follow you? What sure. you got going on? So as far as my comedic journey, if you are um, young, mm-hmm. you can follow me on Instagram at the Cop Comic. If you are old, you can follow me on Facebook at the Cop Comic. <laughs> um, if you're older than that, I don't know. Follow me to my car. Um, <laughs> and then with the club, uh, the club website is jpscomedyclub.com. All our show details are on there. If you are a comedian and you're looking to get booked on a show, um, attend one of our classes that are usually on Monday, Tuesday, or come to an open mic. And we really, really are trying to support local comics and give nice. them opportunities to make them better so they can get booked at the bigger venues. That's fantastic. And all those links are going to be in the show notes. So just go on and tap over there. Not when you first wake up, but like punch the <laughs> ground with your feet first. Okay? Yes, yes. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, thank Jim. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. And we'll talk at you thank next you. time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.